starting off, we have his ex-girlfriend, Gigi Paris. In early 2020, Glenn was linked to model Gigi Paris after they were photographed on a trip to Mexico. Now they broke up after about three years together when Glenn was filming the romantic comedy Anyone But You in Australia. In April 2023, a source told People Magazine that things had actually been off and on since Glenn's role in Top Gun. They had been on the rock since Top Gun came out, Gigi was never happy with the long distance filming, and when she came to Australia, they both decided to break up for good. Now another source said it wasn't about infidelity, she's on different coast modeling, he's on different coast filming. When she left, they were on great terms. Now soon after their breakup though, Gigi posted a video clip of herself walking down the street with the caption, know your worth and on to the next. She then reportedly unfollowed Glenn on Instagram. Now the infidelity rumors stemmed largely from the noted chemistry between Glenn and his co-star Sydney Sweeney, who played up the flirtation for promotion of anyone but you. Glenn then shared that his breakup with Gigi was happening in conjunction with the press tour. The only reason it made things harder for me to lean into that stuff was I was going through a very real breakup amidst a promotional tour, he explained. I was with someone that I really loved and cared about and was trying to kind of make sense of a lot of stuff. It was a lot easier for Sydney to lean into something like that because she's in a very committed and wonderful relationship and she's very happy. So it was a little harder for me. Now he later told Men's Health the speculation about him and Sweeney felt disorienting and unfair. Now Sydney Sweeney has a lot to say about her Anyone But You co-star, but it's all positive. Sydney commented on the dating rumors to Variety, calling the speculation really funny. It's a rom-com, that's what the people want, Glenn and I don't care, she said at the time, unaffected. We have so much fun together and we respect each other so much. He's such a hard worker and I'm a hard worker. We're excited for the press tour and I literally just left ADR with him. We talk all the time, they want it, it's fun to give it to them. They enjoyed their time filming so much that they're even rumored to work together again as leads in The Running Man, director Edgar Wright's remake of the 1987 dystopian game show thriller. So I'd say we'll hopefully see them together soon, but they always seem to be hyping each other up. Now, Glenn's parents are also very supportive and like to tease him. When he attended the premiere of his new Netflix movie, Hitman, he ended up getting hilariously roasted by his own parents. Glenn posed for photos on the red carpet with his mom and dad standing behind him holding handmade signs that playfully poked fun at him. Stop trying to make Glenn Powell happen, a sign held by Glenn's mother said, while his father had another that said, it's never gonna happen. Glenn shared the picture on his Instagram story and jokingly wrote that the hitman had been killed by his own parents. Now Glenn then told Entertainment Tonight that his parents' stunt was inspired by reading negative social media posts about his recent career success. I don't read tweets, but my parents read tweets, so if you're talking shh, know that my parents are reading those tweets, he told the outlet. Now Glenn's parents have actually had cameos in basically every single movie I've done, he noted on The Tonight Show last year. Emma Roberts played Glenn's love interest in the show Scream Queens created by Ryan Murphy. Emma though adored working with Glenn as he played Chad Radwell. Emma has admitted that they both had a hard time making it through a day of filming without laughing up a storm. Glenn and I can't, she stated. Sometimes we have to be like, okay, you really need to stop because we are not going to finish work today. And we've had to be in some pretty funny situations. Now it seems like they had a really fun time working together and she knew that he was movie star material when working with him on the horror comedy. Now speaking of Scream Queens, creator Ryan Murphy has had nothing but nice things to say about working with Glenn. Now Glenn got a job in 2014 and Ryan Murphy Scream Queens playing a wealthy frat guy. Now Ryan liked his energy, but Glenn didn't want to be tied to TV. Being a movie star was always Glenn's dream, Murphy told The Hollywood Reporter earlier this year. He could have done any TV series, but he made it clear that he was chasing something, and I'd get a little mad at him, like what do you mean you're waiting, what are you doing? But he was smart and he was right. Now Daisy Edgar Jones is among the many praising Glenn Powell's rise to fame. Now Daisy spoke to people at a junket for their upcoming action film Twisters, where Daisy took a moment to celebrate her co-star. It's a Glenn Powell summer because of the man, the myth, the legend that is Glenn Powell, she says of Glenn's increasing popularity. Plus Glenn has a secret weapon, his rescue dog Brisket. Brisket has also become a household name this summer, appearing on red carpets and on 
Instagram with his famous dog dad. I think brisket can't take all the credit Daisy says of Glenn's success, adding, but brisket definitely adds to the flavor of joy and fun and fluff. Now that leads us into, yes, brisket the icon. Now Glenn adopted the dog, then a puppy, in July 2023 and started bringing brisket to the action movie set shortly after. Daisy really saw my life before brisket and my life after brisket, Glenn says, of adopting the dog during filming. Now during an appearance on Today, Glenn revealed that he adopted brisket when he was going through a breakup. I remember sitting in a cafe in Enid, Oklahoma, he recounted, and I was like, you know what, I need to be a dog dad. He's been the greatest addition to my life ever, he added. Now brisket easily fit in with Twister's cast and crew, who appreciated having him on set. He's such a beautiful soul, he's a storm chaser, he's been storm chasing with us, Daisy said of the pup. She adds that having comfort animal brisket around on night shoots when the actors were sleepy and looking for snuggles was a delightful treat. He gave such a joy to the whole crew and every department hung out with him while we were shooting different things. He became a mascot for this movie, Glenn explains, a brisket's role on set. And listen, I love brisket and I think I want to meet him more than Glenn. Now we have Zoe Dutch. Now she started alongside Glenn in the rom-com Set It Up. Now everyone loved this film and wanted them to work together again. Now Zoe wanted to work together again too and they ended up planning another project together. Unfortunately it did end up getting scrapped but Zoe had this to say. There is another film with the writer of Set It Up, Katie Silberman, and myself and Glenn Powell. We're all doing another movie together with Netflix. So there's another rom-com coming from us. Now that film would have most likely been Most Dangerous Game per Entertainment Weekly and the duo along with Set It Up's writer and producer Katie Silberman were set to begin production in early 2020 but it seems things sadly didn't work out on that project as Glenn explained years later but the duo does want to work together more. Now Glenn and Tom Cruise became close friends during the production of Top Gun Maverick. Glenn originally auditioned for the role of Rooster but he was beat out by Miles Teller. Now Cruise liked Glenn and offered him the role of Hangman. I said my piece to Tom about what I do and what I do well and he listened. Tom's a listener. He listens to the crew members, he listens to his collaborators, and he hears people, Glenn said. Now one of the signs that Tom really likes Glenn was when he sent him to a theater in Los Angeles to show him a film school video that Cruz had put together for his friends. Now Glenn expected to be among a crowd, but no, it was just for him alone in an empty theater. For six hours, the GQ UK reports. Watching Tom Cruise speak directly to the camera, breaking down everything he's learned about filmmaking over the years. Now, according to Glenn, Cruise has no intention of putting it into the public sphere. He said, it's just for my friends, Glenn said. Then Tom showed him his support by attending Glenn's movie premieres and praising him. And it seems like these two are a Hollywood duo we didn't expect to come together, but this is exactly what we needed. And finally, we have Matthew McConaughey. Glenn went from being a fan of Matthew McConaughey to counting him as a trusted friend. Glenn adds that Matthew has also become a great mentor and friend to him as he adjusts to the spotlight. Now in fact, Glenn recently revealed that Matthew convinced him to leave Hollywood and move back home to Texas. Career wise, things can be disorienting if you let them and Matthew's been such a great friend and source of wisdom for me, Glenn says. Once I felt like I was in Hollywood, I felt comfortable enough to go back home. You can really be an honest observer of humans in Texas, Matthew shared, and he help Glenn with that decision. He's a guy I've looked up to my whole life, so to have Matthew as a guy I can call if I'm ever feeling disoriented or confused about anything that's happening in my life, he's already been on that ride, Glenn said. Matthew then said, you're more than a nice guy, you're a good man, that means standing for things and also standing against things. I hope you just keep it up man, it's an awesome business to create and share and dispatch and put something out there that will outlive us. Naomi Campbell, the legendary supermodel, has been outspoken about how Kendall has risen to fame as a so-called model. On an episode of the Meredith Vieira show, Naomi addressed the issue by saying she wished them the best of luck. I mean, good luck to them. I just feel like my generation of women like Cindy Crawford and Linda Evangelista, Christy Trillington, Claudia Schiffer, we had to earn our stripes and take our stepping stones to get to where we've gotten to. We worked so hard and we're still working at it and it just comes like that for them. But it can also be easy come, easy go. In an interview with People, she also made light of Kendall and her 
her career. She said that her own generation of models was so well known before social media meant something. However, everything changes and evolves and despite this, she still found it interesting. We didn't have social media, so to be known the way we were without it says something I guess. But everything changes, everything evolves, I just find the whole thing fascinating. Of course Taylor Swift doesn't like Kendall Jenner, as she has her beef with her older sister Kim Kardashian and Kanye West. But it actually appears that Taylor didn't really like Kendall before her whole blow up with Kim and Kanye. Now Kim confirmed on Watch What Happens Live that Kendall was never part of Swift's squad, even though they had a number of close friends including models Gigi Hadid, Carly Kloss and Carla Delevingne. Add to the fact that Kendall also appeared at some of Taylor's 1989 tour shows. But Kendall and her sister Kylie mistreated Selena Gomez, who's one of Taylor's best friends, so I'm sure that played a big factor in that. Even more so, I just felt the Look What You Made Me Do videos leg tattoo and orange boots, which were similar to those worn by Kendall, were a snub. Jinta Lapina She began modeling at the age of 14, and she made her debut at number 16 on Forbes Magazine's 2015 list of top earning models, with an estimated annual income of $4 million. In 2017, Kendall was named the world's highest paid model by Forbes, which caused some controversy to say the least. After this, in an interview she did in 2018 with Love Magazine pretty much went viral due to her working comments. She said she was never one of those girls who would do like 30 shows a season or whatever those girls do. More power to them. But I had a million jobs, not only catwalks, but everything else. These comments made many people angry, including fellow models. Model Jinta Lapina shared a screenshot of Jenner's quote with her take, We all are hardworking and worked hard to be where we are. Nothing was ever given to us, she wrote. Lapina also posted on an Instagram story of herself during a shoot, writing, I gotta work with the hashtag I'm not Kim Kardashian. Model Peyton Knight also had her own issues with Kendall's love interview. She added her own hashtag to the post saying, and the privilege, over Jenner's image in her Instagram story. This kind of disrespect towards other models who have no name for themselves walking into the industry is disgusting, she wrote. We don't get to choose which shows to do. She then told the post that she felt triggered by Jenner's quote. She was discounting girls who aren't famous and aren't born into rich families, she says. Their work is nothing, like it's not that hard to do. Afterwards, Kendall took to Twitter to clear up her statement saying it was intended to be entirely complimentary, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, my words were twisted and taken out of context. I want to be clear. The respect that I have for my peers is immeasurable. I get to experience firsthand their tireless commitment, their work ethic, the endless days, the lack of sleep, separation from family and friends, stress of traveling, the toll on physical and mental health. They still make it all look effortless and beautiful. I'm inspired by so many of these people I've had the good fortune to work alongside. There's no way I could ever hate on that. Uh, I don't know how genuine that really is though. It has been said that Rihanna has had a couple of issues with Kendall. Starting off, Rihanna was unhappy with Kendall's association with Chris Brown, Rihanna's ex-boyfriend. Rihanna's feelings were extremely hurt and finds it even more embarrassing because to her, Kendall is just a heartless brat, a source claimed. Then it was said the pair started feuding because Rihanna thought that Kendall had taken Cara Delevingne's friendship away from her. Rihanna has always kept in her possessive streak with Cara because they've had this magnetic attraction towards each other that's never been threatened by anybody else. Sure, they both have other BFFs and partners, but they've always found they could pick up where they left off when they next hung out. While Diddy is clearly not in the public's good graces right now, he once did something hilarious to snub Kendall and Kylie. Diddy is clearly not a fan of the Jenner sisters, which he made apparent after the 2017 Met Gala. Combs Instagram a photo of himself with Jaden Smith, Travis Scott, Wiz Khalifa, and Migos at the event, captioning the snap, Black Excellence. It was later revealed that Combs actually cropped Kendall and Kylie out of the photo. Diddy never commented on why exactly he did it. Maybe it's because they're not black and don't fit with the caption, or he just doesn't like them. Regardless, Twitter reacted swiftly to the alleged snub, with many followers applauding Diddy for the move. Supermodel Stephanie Seymour has also spoken out about the new wave of models, particularly Kendall. She told Vanity Fair, they are completely different than we were. Supermodels are sort of the thing of the past. They deserve their own title. Kendall and Gigi Hadid are beautiful girls, and I support all of them, but they need their own title. Bees of the moment, she cracked. That would be a good title for them. Kendall responded to Seymour's comments in an open letter on her own website, defending not only herself and Gigi, but also giving her own thoughts on real supermodels. Models. If you choose to be a cyber bully, I'm going to stick up for myself, she began. No one is trying to steal Stephanie Seymour's thing or trying to be her. I actually looked up to her. She has a daughter. I guarantee that she didn't imagine someone so publicly shaming her daughter when she made those comments about us being bees of the moment. And while she dismisses Seymour's model moniker, Kendall maintains that her industry is more about work ethic than labels. I don't know though, both Kendall and Gigi are Nepo babies, so they've gotten a lot of advantages over the years. Model Rebecca Romine had an issue with Kendall with how she rose to fame and 
didn't deserve her success. Rebecca told Entertainment Tonight, no one has proven yet that numbers of followers translates to revenue, so it is frustrating, she added. I know a lot of people are legitimate fashion people and I can't stand it. I hate it that these you know, social media stars are now the supermodels in fashion. They are not true supermodels. She then added, I would disappoint that fashion magazines have been supporting this trend of social media stars to set our style standards. But it will change. Fashion always does. However, Rebecca later referred her previous statement to Us Weekly saying, first of all, I was asked my opinion about a social media trend. No specific names were ever mentioned. Secondly, I'm embarrassed that I even used the word supermodel. It's a dumb word that has always been too loosely thrown around Kendall and a stratosphere that I never came close to in the model world. It's not a competition and we don't get anything out of pitting women against each other. Hmm, it sounds like she's just trying to cover her tracks, but she had some really good points. The Doors For some backstory, a couple years ago Kendall and Kylie released shirts for their clothing brand with images of iconic singers and rappers. The problem was they didn't get permission to use these images and it caused a lot of controversy. Now one of the bands they used was The Doors and the surviving members of The Doors sent the Jenners a cease and desist letter for using their image on merch. The Doors have recently learned that Kendall and Kylie are selling shirts using their protected products property without the doors authorization or consent, the letter reads. The use of the registered trademarks in commerce is likely to cause confusion, mistake, or to deceive consumers into believing that the Kendall Kylie apparel was authorized by the doors when no such authorization was sought or provided by the doors. The superimposing of a selfie of Kendall Jenner over the iconic lion portrait of the late Jim Morrison is offensive and remarkable for its failure to recognize the rights of the estate of Mr. Morrison to control the use of his likeness. Jeff Jampol, manager of the doors and Morrison's estate, told Rolling Stone, this is a case of people who fashion themselves as celebrities who are famous for being well known but don't actually do anything trying to utilize and steal and capitalize on the legacies of those who actually did something and create amazing art and messages. It's ironic at least and criminal at worst. Yeah, that the Jenners never contacted the surviving members of the Doors. They're obviously attention seeking missiles who crave celebrity and being well known but don't actually do anything, Jan Poole said. It's the polar opposite of the artists that they're trampling all over. It's just spitting in the face and on top of art and message and soul and legacy. Yikes, but he's technically not wrong. Anderson Cooper The Kardashian Jenner family are always in the media and they've been on pretty much every single talk show there is except for Anderson Cooper's. When he hosted Anderson Live for two years, he already knew that he did not want any of the car Jenners on his new daytime talk show despite the fact that the family admired him. Now he did not ban them. When he appeared on Watch What Happens Live, the journalist told Andy Cohen that the family were already everywhere and all over the media so he simply didn't have anything new to say to them. So what would be the point of having them on his daytime talk show? And I mean hey, he really has a point there. Now starting off we have Russell Crowe, as Russell recently made some non-flattering comments about Dakota. But first, some backstory. Earlier this year, Dakota's film Madam Web was released and it was just horrible. It wasn't well received by the public and critics, receiving an 11% score on Rotten Tomatoes. Now, it wasn't just the audience who had a problem with film, but the actors did too. Dakota and her co-star Sydney Sweeney spoke out about the film. Now, despite admitting on previous occasions that she hadn't even watched the film, Dakota, who starred in the film, recently addressed its failures head on, telling Bustle, unfortunately, I'm not surprised that this has gone down the way it has. But it was definitely an experience for me to make that movie. I'd never done anything like that before. The Madam Web's debut marked the lowest ever opening for any film in the Sony Spider-Man universe and also marked one of the worst openings for a movie based on a Marvel Comics character. Dakota then doubted that she would ever make a similar kind of movie. I probably will never do anything like it again because I don't make sense in that world, she told Bustle. And I know that now, but sometimes in the industry, you sign on to something and it's one thing, then as you're making it, it becomes a completely different thing and you're like, wait, what? But it was a real learning experience. She continued by saying, and of course, it's not nice to be a part of something that's ripped to shreds, but I can't say that I don't understand. Dakota also blamed the studio system for the ways in which it produces movies as having a negative effect on Madam Web. It's so hard to get movies made, and in these big movies that get made, decisions are being made by committees, and art does not do well when it's made by committees, she went on. Films are made by a filmmaker and a team of artists around them. You can't make art based on numbers and algorithms. My feeling has been for a long time that audiences are extremely smart, and executives have started to believe that they're not. All I gotta say is, now all I I gotta say is I agree with her there. Now she said, I hadn't seen the movie, I probably won't, I don't know when I'll see it. Someday, did you see the movie? I haven't. You know more about it than me. And listen, I don't blame her there, I watched it and it was painful to get through. This is definitely one of the worst 
movies. Now, Russell Crowe had a problem with her expressing how she felt and he called her out. He said, you're telling me you signed up for a Marvel movie and some effing universe for cartoon characters and you didn't get enough pathos, he said in a recent interview with GQ UK. Not quite sure how I can make this better for you, it's a gigantic machine and they make movies at a certain size. Now, Russell, who did declare that he didn't want to make any comments to anybody else who might have said or what their experience is, also pointed out that he has experience with superhero films, having starred in DC's Man of Steel and Marvel's Thor Love and Thunder. He's also in Sony and Marvel's upcoming movie, Kraven the Hunter, which is set in the same universe as Madam Web. These are jobs, he said. You know, here's your role, play the role. If you're expecting this to be some kind of life changing event, I just think you're here for the wrong reasons. However, Russell did acknowledge that doing superhero movies can be challenging at times, and that as an actor in those projects, you sometimes have to convince yourself a lot more than the internal feelings of your character. Now, I gotta say, I don't agree with him here. Dakota wants to be a storyteller and be attached to her character, but it seems like she didn't have that much to work with on Madam Web, and she was honest about that. I don't think she should be punished for that. Now, after this mess of a movie and a report from Variety about the Spider-Man spin-off franchise, it's mentioned that Dakota switched agencies, deciding to swap WME for CAA in November, just days after the first Madam Web trailer debuted. Now, it's said that this move raised industry eyebrows, but it's important to note that the trailer was widely mocked upon its release, with many movie fans clowning on its dated aesthetic and costumes, clunky dialogue, and uninteresting characters. And as we know now, the movie was a huge flop. Now, this isn't the first time Dakota has been blunt in interviews. She had an infamous interview with Ellen on the Ellen DeGeneres show years ago, and she put Ellen in her place, so it's safe to say that Ellen doesn't like her too much. Now, during one episode on the show, Ellen insisted that Dakota didn't invite her to her birthday and threw some shade. Now, without hesitating, Dakota shut down this false claim and said that the last time that she was on Ellen's show, Ellen gave her a hard time about not inviting her, so she did this year. Dakota then advised Ellen to ask her producer about her lost invitation, stating, I did invite you and you didn't come. Ask everybody, before turning to Ellen's producers for backup. They then confirmed that the host had indeed been invited to the bash, but had chosen to not attend. Now, while it was an awkward exchange, it is one of the most iconic times someone has put Ellen in her place. Now, Dakota has altered our brain chemistry multiple times during her interviews, but one that sticks out was when she did her architectural digest open door house tour video. Now, during the video, she walked past a platter of fruit in her kitchen, which was limes, and she claimed, I love limes, I love them, they're great, I love them so much, and I like to present them like this in my home. Now, it's safe to assume that these were staged for the interview, but she went so into loving them, fans were convinced that she truly did love limes. But later that year, when Dakota went on Jimmy Fallon's The Tonight Show, she admitted, I actually didn't even know that the limes were there. I'm actually allergic to limes. I'm mildly allergic to limes and honeydew melon. Hey. At least she came clean, but what a strange thing to lie about. Then, if you didn't know, Dakota is actually a Nepo baby. She is the daughter of Don Johnson and Melanie Griffith. Now, in the past year or so, there has been a lot of talk about Nepo babies and how they get advantages in their careers that other people don't, and it was just a big, huge debate. Now, Dakota's opinion on it though, she said she found the term incredibly annoying as she jumped at the chance to make fun of it on Saturday Night Live. When that first started, I found it to be incredibly annoying and boring, she said during an appearance on the Today Show. If you're a journalist, write about something else, that's just lame. So the opportunity to make fun of it, I jumped at. Now, while on the show, Dakota also spoke about her father and said he cut her off financially when she refused to change her mind about pursuing a career in acting. He cut me off, so it was difficult, but I figured it out. Dakota said that her actor and producer father told her and her siblings that they would still get an allowance if they went to college. He said, if you go to college, you'll get an allowance, the actress said. And I was like, well, I'm going to be an actress. So he was like, all right, well, you're on your own. Now, the actress recounted taking modeling jobs to pay her 
her rent and eventually started to show up for auditions. Now, when she couldn't afford groceries, she would turn to her mother because she was the nice one, Dakota joked. Now, after a few small roles here and there, Dakota's career forever changed when she decided to be the star of the Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy. Now, Dakota recalled being unsure about the movie initially and said she couldn't talk to her family about it. It was actress Emily Blunt's advice that encouraged her to say yes to the movie that pushed her into stardom. I couldn't talk about it to anybody, nobody in my family knew, Dakota said in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter. I was cast and I remember I spoke to Emily Blunt and I was like, should I do this trilogy because I want to have a really special career and I want to make a certain kind of film and I know that this is going to change things. She was like, effing do it if it feels right, just do it. Always do what you want to do. So she went through with the films, but there was rumors of a feud between Dakota and her co-star Jamie Dornan. But Dakota told Vanity Fair that there was absolutely no bad blood between them. She said there was never a time where we didn't get along, I know it's weird, but he's like a brother to me, I love him so 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 much, and we were really there for each other, we had really trust each other and protect each other. However, she did say that working on the set of the Fifty Shades films did feel psychotic too. This then led to an awkward interview with her own mother. Now at the time of this red carpet interview with her mother Melanie Griffith, her movie Fifty Shades of Grey had recently come out. Now being rated R due to themes and nude scenes, an interviewer asked Melanie if she had seen the film. Now Melanie will do anything to support her daughter, except for watching a sexually explicit film starring her, and honestly, I don't blame her. Now the two got into a very uncomfortable conversation after being asked whether Melanie had seen the movie. Melanie simply responded no, then added, I don't think I can, I think it would be strange. All right, you don't have to see it, argued Dakota. If she tells me to see it, I'll see it, her mother said. And Dakota followed this up with, I tell you to see it and you're like, eh. Yeah, this was definitely an awkward moment between a mother and daughter in general, but in regards to them talking about Fifty Shades of Grey, I feel like it's even awkwarder. I just want to know who greenlit that question for the interviewer because it's an incredibly awkward and strange question to ask. Now, Dakota also recently spoke about being in the finale of The Office and how she didn't have a good experience. She said, I love that show so much and they were like, do you want to be in the series finale, she recalled. And I was like, of course, thinking I'd show up for like half a day. I was there for two weeks and I'm barely in the show. Now, it didn't help that the vibe on set was depressing given it was the sitcom's last episode and she felt out of place coming into an environment where everyone else knew each other. There were weird dynamics that had been going on for the last 10 years, she explained. Some people didn't speak to each other and I'm coming in like so excited to be here and nobody wanted to talk to me. Nobody gave a blank. Now, hearing this made some fans angry as Dakota should have been more understanding. Starting off with the trouble with the 2011 Oscars, which was infamously hosted by Anne and James Franco, well, it started well before showtime. The messy showcase has gone down in history as one of the worst Academy Award ceremonies of all time. Not the worst, but it's up there. When it came time to film stuff for the show ahead of time, Anne showed up ready to play, she was committed 110%, and James was described as being a great guy, but uh, looked like he just woke up for a nap. Somebody described it as, you know, you're showing up to a tennis court, one person decided that they were going to play in the US Open, the other one just wanted to play in jeans and maybe hit a couple of balls. A source who wrote for the live telecast says that he remembers hearing that the friction started when Anne decided to offer James Franco a stray acting note during rehearsals. She was like, hey, maybe you should try that. And he was like, mm. Don't tell me how to be funny. Yeah, it's no surprise they never cemented any kind of bond. Watching it was like the world's most uncomfortable blind date between the cool stoner kid and the adorable theater camp cheerleader. Apparently they've, you know, kissed made up now, but that all just sounds like the worst combination of creative hell possible. I'm fully aware that quoting Howard Stern is low hanging fruit, but he's the walking definition of someone who has managed to make a career out of being a hater and well that was relevant for today. During an interview with <laughs> James Franco, he said, everyone sort of hates Anne Hathaway and I've explained that I do too and I don't even know why sometimes. She's just so affected and actressy that even when she wins an award she's out of breath and then she has a standard joke that sounds like it's been written for her and it all seems so scripted and acted. She comes off like the goody two shoes actress and is just sort of fun to hate her. Howard went on to add, hate is a strong word, but I dislike her even though she's a great actress. Is that accurate? James was like, well, I'm not an expert on half the haters, but I think that's what maybe triggers it. Wow. Talk about the pot calling the kettle black. Not only that, but he had the audacity to talk about the disastrous Oscars hosting together, making it sound like she was the one who came begging to become friends with him again instead of the other way around. Let the history book show he's the one who begged her to host with him. 
In the years leading up to Judd Apatow's Knocked Up, Anne Hathaway had proven herself to be one of the industry's most exciting rising stars. Seeing as before this, she'd done Brokeback Mountain, Devil Wears Prada, Princess Diaries. She was becoming more and more sought after by the minute. Her prowess, her undeniable charm, they captivated this director's attention, and he was like, hmm. I think she's the perfect lead for my rom com. But she backed out last minute after part of the script was like, not meshing with her. This was the scene that depicted a woman explicitly giving birth, and Anne was like, I think this is unnecessary to the storyline. In her own words, I turned down Knocked Up because it was going to show a vagina. Not mine, but somebody else's. And I didn't believe that it was necessary to the story. Now, yes, the director did say there's no bad blood now, but apparently back in the day that wasn't the case. Leaving a director scrambling last minute isn't the girl boss move Anne thought it was, and it only added to her diva reputation, which I'll touch on more in a moment. Looking back, movies like Knocked Up were kind of like the epitome of early 2000s romantic comedies that were very much a product of the times. And while a lot of folks still appreciate such films, yeah, you can't deny the oddly unsettling storylines, the dated language, all of which perfectly reflect some of the era's biggest shortcomings regarding societal acceptance and inequality. Richard Lawson of the Atlantic Wire told Hollywood.com that Hathaway has this theater kid thing where she adopts the mood of every situation she's in. Rude and body on Chelsea lately, poised and classy at the Oscars, but wildly overcompensating every single time. Now he continued on, like that wasn't all he had to say. She always seems like she's performing, and her favorite act is this overstated humility and gracious. On the other hand, writer Victoria Wellman is one half of the Oratory Laboratory, a site that helps craft client speeches. And part of Anne's problem is just the actress is one of those people who doesn't really come off as sincere. Take for example her award show speeches. I've talked about it a bit today. The whole point of award shows is that nobody knows who's going to win, and you know, the audience counts on that element of surprise to be part of a winner's speech. But Anne's words of gratitude came off as way too rehearsed, not the usual like, oh my god! And the more you rehearse something, the more kind of presumptuous it comes across. Like, yes, we are used to seeing actors act, but we do want to see a glimpse of their personality. So when it came to the Golden Globe speech, it was just very word for word. So, is she just a phony after all? Or is she someone who wants desperately to fit in and she's trying her best? I'll let you decide in the comments. I don't think Matt Lauer is on the top of anybody's most liked list these days, and it's pretty obvious why. But hey, back in the day when this man was still employed on the Today Show, he had a pretty icky interaction with Andy that needs to be noted. So, 2012, Anne's on a press tour for Les Mis, and uh, a photographer crouched down as she got out of a car, and he got an upskirt photo. Which was a horrifically sleazy thing for this pap to do. But then Anne was a guest on Today, and Matt was like, hmm. That's a you problem. Specifically, he opened it with, like, nice to see you. And then, seen a lot of you lately. Now, Anne did her best. She tried to play it off as though he's talking about the oversaturated press cycle. She's just like, yeah, you know, I'd be happy to stay home, but the film, like, she's doing her best. And uh, Buddy's like, mm mm mm, let's just get it out of the way. You had a little wardrobe malfunction the other night. And like, he raised his eyebrows. Like, she's right there. And the guy's just like, mm hmm. What's the lesson learned from something like that? other than you keep smiling, which you always do. It was just so icky and gross. Ugh, men. Now, Anne's response was very, very graceful. She was like, it was obviously an unfortunate incident, and it kind of made me sad on two accounts. One was that I was very sad, where we live in an age where somebody takes a picture of another person in a vulnerable moment, and rather than delete it and do the decent thing, they sell it. And she's like, I'm sorry that we live in a culture that commodifies the sexuality of unwilling participants. And she's like, that brings us back to Les Mis. Like, very good. The fact that their conversation even acknowledges the fact that what happened to her was a violation of privacy, but an attempt to humiliate her for the fact of possessing a female body? Ugh. It just hurts my brain. Matt frames the conversation as though what happened to her was an error on her part that she's got to learn a lesson from. And just his way of doing it and his instinct to raise the question in the first place reinforces this awful ideology where women's bodies are both inherently humiliating and public property. It's this ideology that helps perpetrate a culture in which men can just, you know, harass and do whatever they want to women in private and get away with it. And well, now that we know about Matt, I'm not surprised. And has had a couple of other stories come out about her supposed diva behavior, by the way. For one instance, uh, she reportedly sent a list of demands before agreeing to attend the Pink Party Gala, which was a cancer research charity event. According to Radar Online, an email to those working the gala says her team was getting really concerned that people would try to approach her for photos and autographs. Now, they've said like other celebrities who would be attending didn't make those kinds of demands. One source told InTouch that everybody was asked to not talk to her. And apparently the event staff was like, yeah, 
I know in the past our hosts have mingled at the party, but everybody's different and we want to respect her space. And sure, people respected her space, but it seemed like she still wasn't having a good time. The stories revealed she was so rude and acted like a B-I-T-C-H to a couple of people that she did speak to. She just sat there rolling her eyes all night. Not a good move, girl. Anne was apparently a nightmare to deal with for an onset chef, setting back her breakfast multiple times. For context, she was shooting a commercial on the Paramount lot and she wanted to order an English muffin, a poached egg, and an avocado for breakfast. TMZ reported that she sent the dish back not one, not two, four times. So the first time the meal was brought to her, apparently the poached egg was too runny. So sent it back. And then the next time, now her English muffin is too cold because it was sitting there waiting for the egg to be poached. Okay, I guess she has to have all of her food together at the same time in order to eat. So then her English muffin was taken away, but maybe she just didn't eat it? Nevertheless, it looks like it went to waste for no good reason. Now, fourth time around, the meal's perfect. But apparently it took so long that now Anne was in the mood for a fried egg. So she wasted this entire meal that she originally wanted just to change her mind. Not it. I don't like wasting food. So I know I've mentioned a couple of other journalists earlier today, but then there's still some notable ones that have also had some things to say about Anne, such as Anne Friedman, pun not intended, who is well known for being an incredible journalist. This one stood out to me. She took a poll amongst peers about their opinions on Anne, and the results were not nice. She's that theater kid with good intentions, but secretly annoys the SHIT out of you. You want to be excited for her, but and like you are, but deep down, you're just rolling your eyes. And also, I think someone told her she was America's sweetheart and she believed it. One friend in particular placed Anne in the category of really affected drama queens, saying I can imagine her not ironically yelling acting. In other words, she's always on stage, always calculated, not someone whom you'd want to party with or share your deepest secrets. If you can't trust her, that's not good. So way back before Margot Robbie was in the conversation to become the iconic Barbie we all know and love today, Anne was announced as being attached to the project, but then got ditched when it transferred from Sony to Warner. I wonder what the execs at Warner had against her unless they know something we don't. And how about we end today with Annie's poor choice and an ex-boyfriend, Raffaello Folieri. He went to prison in 2008 for four and a half years after he pleaded guilty in Manhattan federal court to 14 counts of conspiracy, wire fraud, and money laundering. Anne didn't break up with him until like right before he went to prison. And you've gotta question her ethics for not breaking up with him sooner. Like, how did she not know this? Like, how did she not notice the guy was a scam artist? Like, I feel like that would have been obvious.